Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Stephanie Seneff, and I'm a senior research scientist at MIT. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in biology from MIT and a PhD from MIT also in com electrical engineering and computer science. I've worked at MIT all my life. Um, and most of my, for most of my research, I, I was involved with developing uh, computer spoken dialogue systems, systems that allow a computer to communicate with humans using trying to make it use the natural language, natural dialogue uh, communication. Um, about seven years ago, I got very interested in uh, autism because I was worried about what I perceived as some kind of environmental factors that must be causing the obvious uh, increase in, in the incidence of autism. So um, I started studying it, and I used my computer science tools to help me analyze research literature, analyze uh, databases like, for example, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, and um, uh, started looking and trying to find out uh, which uh, environmental factors might be playing a role in autism. So yes, yeah, so, so it took me five years of research on autism. I gathered a lot of data. I found some evidence that aluminum and mercury uh, toxicity were playing an important role. Sun t sunlight deficiency was also a factor, and I could see that from um, from the association between the uh, these these factors and the autism uh, syndrome, which is a very complex syndrome with many uh, comorbid comorbidities. Um, but it was fi five years after struggling to find the answer that I finally did find the answer in a uh, presentation that I heard by Professor Don Huber, um, who is a retired uh, expert. Um, an academician. He's a retired professor from Purdue University um, and studied uh, plant physiology and plant pathology his entire life. And he has been uh, tirelessly campaigning since retirement on around the world on, the, on his uh, conviction that glyphosate is the most critical, most dangerous toxin in our environment today. And I was blown away by his two-hour presentation because he solved all the remaining problems that I had, where I had gaps, where I could see autism had these different features, such as the gut dysbiosis, uh, a lot of problems with the gut, um, that I wasn't able to explain with the things that I had studied so far. So all of a sudden, everything fell into place. The sulfur deficiency as well, and the dysbiosis of sulfur, um, and the serotonin deficiency. So all of these things that I was aware of were problems in autism that I hadn't been able to explain, then all of a sudden I could explain them with this molecule. Uh, I don't understand why uh, the U.S. government is not recognizing the dangers of glyphosate. I think that Monsanto, the producer of glyphosate, has done a very good job of convincing them that there's no need to worry. And um, so they've been, uh, Monsanto claims that it's harmless to humans, or nearly harmless to hum humans, uh, because we, and they say why, which is that we don't have the pathway that it disrupts in, in uh, uh, plants. And so that's, a, I guess, a reasonable enough explanation that most people want to believe it, and therefore they don't go any further than that. Um, but if you do take a deeper look at what glyphosate actually does uh, to cells of all sorts, and, the, and, they've, and there have been studies on uh, microbes and studies on um, animal models, and there have been very, very, probably no studies on humans, uh, which is really unfortunate when this is the most widely used uh, herbicide on the planet. So I just should say glyphosate is the active ingredient in the pervasive weed killer round, Roundup, which people can go down to the hardware store and buy to use to kill the weeds in their, in their yard. People are careless with it because they don't consider it to be toxic. And it's used in, in enormous amounts in the agricultural uh, world, uh, specifically and especially on the GMO Roundup Ready crops. That's one of the major GMO um, uh, GMOs that exist in, in, in the world are these uh, genetically modified uh, plants, and these are the core crops of the processed food industry. Soy, corn, uh, canola oil, sugar beets, which is, of course, sugar. Um, there's really only a few, uh, alfalfa is another one, of these core crops that are Roundup ready, which means that they uh, don't die when they're sprayed with Roundup, and then as a consequence, they soak it up, and, there's getting, and we're getting a lot more residue in our uh, food as a consequence.
yeah, Roundup uh, glyphosate uh, by itself is toxic, but it has a hard time getting into the cells. So they've actually, uh, they, they've found out, they've discovered that if they add these additional surfactant factors uh, to the Roundup, then to the, to the glyphosate to make the product Roundup, then they can make the glyphosate much more toxic to plants than it would otherwise be. Unfortunately, it's also much more toxic to our cells as well. And in fact, uh, studies have shown a 125-fold increase in toxicity of glyphosate in the presence of these uh, surfactants. And when they study glyphosate in, in isolation, they don't put these surfactants in. So they're, they're lying about the toxicity by, by a factor of 125 in these studies. I know, that's another thing that Monsanto has assured us, that they, it, it flushes through very quickly and goes out in the urine, and we shouldn't have to worry about it accumulating. Um, the evidence is not strong because almost nobody has looked to see exactly what happens to the glyphosate in humans. There has been a very recent study on chickens that showed it accumulating in several tissues, including the muscles. And of course, the muscles are, are, the, are the meat. So that means if you're eating a chicken that's been fed a lot of glyphosate-containing food, you're going to get glyphosate in the meat. Um, a human study was done by a, a, a group of moms in an organization called Moms Across America, and these moms uh, sent off their breast milk for evaluation for glyphosate. These were moms who were conscientious about GMOs and trying to avoid them. And uh, some 30% of the moms had glyphosate present in their milk, and in their milk at a higher concentration than it was present in their urine, which is an indication of bioaccumulation in the milk because it's being concentrated there. So that's very, very disturbing. This might also explain why people are having so much trouble with casein and milk intolerance, you know, various uh, uh, problems with uh, milk products because, potentially, because the milk contains glyphosate, I'm suspecting. Because the cows are given huge amounts of glyphosate in their food, in their food, which comes from the GMO Roundup Ready corn and soy. Yeah, well, obviously, the breast milk is going to go to the baby, and the baby is going to get exposed to glyphosate very early in life. Of course, even probably uh, in the fetus. The fetus is probably also getting exposed to glyphosate, or if not, it's getting exposed to the consequence of a hostile environment because of what glyphosate does to everything else. And, and I, we can get into this later, but glyphosate chelates minerals, which causes them to be unavailable. And so mineral deficiency becomes a problem, and in particular, cobalamin deficiency is a huge factor associated with um, issues during pregnancy, preeclampsia, for example, which is a very um, scary condition that develops in the third trimester and can be due to uh, co cobalamin deficiency. Cobalamin uh, requires cobalt, and cobalt is chelated by glyphosate. Studies on cows show, showed extremely low levels of cobalt uh, in the blood across the board on eight different dairy farms in Denmark. Yeah, that's just absolutely fascinating, and I'm reading more and more about it and struggling with the chemistry and the physics of it all. It's very fascinating, and I'm discovering, I'm looking at several different minerals, um, certainly starting with cobalt, iron, uh, molybdenum, um, manganese, at least, and then also aluminum and arsenic, which are not uh, minerals that we want. Those are toxic metals, and all of those uh, become disrupted uh, and dangerous in the context of glyphosate. So chelation means that it basically puts a cage around the uh, molecule, around the uh, atom, the uh, the mineral, and makes it unavailable to the gut bacteria. And for example, the lactobacillus critically depend on manganese um, for their thrive, for their survival, and uh, they become uh, impaired when there isn't when the manganese isn't available. And so I think the glyphosate is depriving them of their manganese, causing them then to not grow well. And they play an important role in chasing out all the pathogens. So when they can't grow, pathogens take over, and you end up with the inflammatory gut that's become an epidemic in the American society. In fact, studies have been done on chickens, and they've shown by both bifidobacteria and lactobacillus are disrupted by glyphosate. And then uh, Clostridium difficile overgrows in the context of, of glyphosate. And that's a very serious, we've had a huge issues with C. difficile recently. In hospitals, there have been these infections that uh, are resistant to all multiple antibiotics. So I think this is a consequence of the comfortable environment that glyphosate is setting up for these pathogens to allow them to grow. It looks that way. It looks to me like that the glyphosate disrupts the things that the beneficial bacteria need to thrive. 
And so the consequence is then that the pathogens take over, and then that causes a host of problems to the, to the person. Uh, and once your gut is out of order, then all kinds of things go wrong, including your nervous system, because there's a very strong connection between the gut and the brain. The gut-brain axis is something that people, researchers are studying very intently these days. Right. No, it's very, very interesting with manganese. And I had, it took me a while, just like it took me a while to discover glyphosate, five years of looking. Then after I had discovered glyphosate and read extensively about it, it took me at least a year, maybe even a year and a half, to realize manganese. And that what tipped me off, I had sort of seen manganese, yeah, because I knew that manganese was a, was a critical factor in how glyphosate uh, kills the plant, because the enzyme that it disrupts depends on manganese. So that was a big hint. But then I sort of hadn't heard much about manganese in human physiology, and I thought, well, maybe it's not that important to humans. But then I saw this article by, about these cows, and I mentioned it earlier, cobalt. They looked uh, at the cows that were being fed GMO Roundup Ready corn and soy, and they looked at a bunch of different minerals, and they found two that were severely depleted. So that was a big clue. Those are the two I should be looking at, manganese and cobalt. So cobalt, I mentioned cobalamin, which is incredibly important to your physiology. Manganese. When I saw that, I, had, I was scratching my head because I didn't really know which uh, enzymes are, are affected by manganese deficiency. So I started diving in and reading all about manganese. And I was shocked with what I found because I found that every single thing that was affected by manganese deficiency fit right into uh, issues that we have today in health. So it was like, wow, it has to be the case that glyphosate is messing up the manganese. And um, so the, you mentioned the glutamate. Um, there's a glutamine synthase that depends upon manganese to work, to function, and it takes glutamate and ammonia as input, and it produces glutamine as output, a very, very important enzyme because it's used in the brain to prevent glutamate toxicity and ammonium toxicity. And in fact, in autism, I had already written a paper about glutamate and, and ammonia specifically in the brain in association with autism, causing a kind of low-grade chronic encephalopathy I wrote that before I knew anything about glyphosate. But once I knew about the manganese problem with glyphosate, then all of a sudden it made sense why this was happening. Right, well, I was really, uh, I was fascinated by this. Um, I've been reading about the starfish. Of course, I know about the coral crisis, and I've been puzzled about that. What is causing the coral worldwide to be really, really uh, in trouble? The coral is dying everywhere around the world. Um, and so what's causing that? And then the starfish on the West Coast, which they've, been, they've come up with this very bizarre starfish uh, disorder where they basically uh, melt. Their, their skeleton just starts kind of turning into goo. It's extremely malformed. Um, and so. You know, of course, people are struggling to figure out what's causing this. I suspect glyphosate uh, in both cases because um, the, uh, they, both the coral and the starfish depend upon manganese for enzymes that are used to make a chondroitin sulfate, which is a critical, critical piece of their skeleton. So their skeleton becomes severely disturbed in the absence of sufficient manganese and glyphosate chelates manganese. And so I looked around and I found out that manganese is, I mean, that glyphosate is used. I was horrified to find this out because oysters are really, really healthy food and I think that they're very important for re renewing all of your minerals because they have a tremendous amount of mineral content. Um, but unfortunately, the more oysters on the West Coast, on the oyster farms are being, uh, glyphosate's being applied to them to kill the seagrass that's growing around the oysters. And the um, starfish eat oysters, so they come in and they get exposed to the seagrass, to the glyphosate in the seagrass, I'm suspecting, or even in the oyster, which really horrifies me because we, you know, no one's tested glyphosate levels in oysters, and I'm afraid to find out what it is. So, pesticides, why are adjuvants added to pesticides, and, and what is that, how does that matter in terms of our ecosystem? Right. Well, so they, I mean, they figured out that you can put in these adjuvants, which are usually surfactants, which cause the uh, cells to be, uh, the, it messes up the cell wall. And so it causes the cells, uh, the, the active ingredient in the, in the pesticide to be more readily enter the cell, even more readily enter the mitochondria within the cell. And so, um, and this has been confirmed with glyphosate, that the glyphosate uh, enters the cell much more readily in the presence of these um, adjuvants. And of course, they use them then to make it more toxic to the plant or more toxic to the pest. To the, to the pest. So um, for them, it's like, great, this makes it more toxic, let's do it. 
But unfortunately, they don't necessarily study it in that same context when they try to evaluate its toxicity in order to report to the to the FDA or something about the or the EPA about the uh, safety of this um, chemical. Yes, I was so thrilled when I saw, that. first of all, a wonderful, wonderful paper written by some Sri Lankans. And these people were intent on trying to understand what was causing kidney failure among young agricultural workers. This is now when it was occurring in an epidemic rage among these workers. Uh, and it's been observed in both the sugarcane fields and in the rice fields uh, in Sri Lanka and also in Central America and in India. Um, the agricultural workers are in trouble with kidney failure. And so uh, these workers did a very careful study looking at the places where the agricultural workers were affected and the places where they weren't. And they discovered that an area where they were growing organic, none of, the, um, none of the workers were sick. None of them had any problem with kidney failure. And in an area where glyphosate was being used, and also this area had previously had a lot of exposure to arsenic. So the soil, because arsenic had also been used previously as a weed killer, and then they sort of switched over to glyphosate. So they kind of had a combination of arsenic and glyphosate. And these people figured out that that was very synergistically dangerous because the glyphosate, just arsenic is another mineral, just like um, all the other ones, glyphosate cages arsenic and carries it like a stealth bomb uh, past the gut barrier because of the fact that it can uh, hide the, the plus three charge on the molecule, on the atom, and make it much easier to get across the gut barrier. Takes it right past the liver and delivers it straight to the kidney where there's an acidic environment that allows then, in the acidic environment, glyphosate lets go. So it's a perfect stealth bomb. and delivers the arsenic to the kidney and also delivers the glyphosate to the kidney at the same time because when the two are combined, the molecule is relatively safe, the combination. But once it opens up because of the acidic environment, both of them become toxic and the kidneys get damaged. And this was the explanation they offered uh, in, in the paper. And this is what led the government to be uh, immediately proactive and say, OK, we're banning glyphosate. And El Salvador also followed suit for the same reasons. So now two countries have banned glyphosate usage in, our, in agriculture, which makes me very, very happy because I'm hoping there will be a trend with more and more countries uh, following suit.